Welcome to On Top of PR with Jason Mudd, presented by Review Maxer. Hello and welcome to On Top of PR with Jason Mudd. I am Jason Mudd, your host, and today we are jo- joined by John Hewitt. Uh, we're really glad to have John on this episode. Uh, John is the CEO and founder of Loyalty Brands, but you probably know John from his other endeavors, including uh, creating or founding um, the uh, successful tax preparation company, uh, Jackson Hewitt. Um, and so, John, welcome to the show. We're glad you're here. Thanks, Jason. It's my pleasure. So you are a renowned entrepreneur who's made a significant impact in the business world through innovative ideas and strategic thinking. You're best known for your success in the tax preparation industry, having founded the two largest tax preparation companies in the United States. John, tell me about uh, what led you into the tax prep business? Uh, You know, I was blessed when I was 20 years old to find out what I wanted to do. My dad, was a frustrated entrepreneur and he always wanted to be self-employed but i was born when he was at michigan state and he had two other children before we he left college and two quickly after that so he never had a chance until i was 20 years old to to investigate uh, being self-employed because he needed to make money to support the family so he called h and r block in 1969 and asked them uh, to if he could buy a franchise in Hamburg, New York, a suburb of Buffalo. And they said, well, as a matter of fact, we're going to open a company store there this year. Why don't you have your son t- take our course? And maybe he could work for us. So I started working for H&R Block and loved it, loved franchising, loved taxes. And uh, that was 50, 54 years ago. Interesting. So for full disclosure, one of my very first clients was H&R Block many years ago. Um, and uh, so, John, tell me, uh, what made you interested in taxes? What did you like about it? There were several things. Number one, it was a world without computers. It was 1969. In fact, we didn't even have uh, calculators. We had to use adding machines back in, wow. in that day. <laughs> so I, I'm very good at math and multiplying, adding, dividing. And so that came in handy. We, in, a, in a world without computers and calculators. And uh, also it's uh, people are people are scared of the IRS and afraid and, yes. and not knowledgeable on taxes. So it was helping people and mm-hmm. that that drew my attention. And, and it was a love of the law and the ability to argue about the gray issues in the tax system. So those three things combined to make it a perfect um, type of opportunity for me. Perfect. Talk to me about your growth. I mean, obviously you had incredible growth, but where did you go from uh, being with um, H&R Block into deciding to start your own business? And then how did it grow from there? Yes, 12 years later, I was managing 250 H&R Block office and it was 1981. My dad was a CFO of a public company, and he decided that we should computerize taxes. He liked the the little Apple computer better than the mainframe that was running his uh, public company. And so in 1981, we both quit our jobs and built the tax, first tax software for an Apple computer. No one wanted it. It was way ahead of its time. Right. Got blessed, and we found a company in Virginia Beach called Mel Jackson Tax Service. Mel had died. We bought six offices from his widow. Over the next 15 years, we changed the name to Jackson Hewitt, merged mm-hmm. the two companies, went public, and sold it for $483 million. Wow. Wow. That's a great story. Uh, who was the entrepreneur behind that? Was that you or your dad or a combination? Well, my dad was the my, uh, my um, introduction, and uh, I've been... I have the same kind of personality, a lot like my dad. So I was uh, um, very much attracted to the opportunity and uh, we did it together. We did, after that, we did all of our companies together. Nice, that's a great story. Um, So you're not a believer in people who might say that uh, the best family business has one family member and that blood and business don't mix. You feel very different about that. 
um, totally because it, it actually brought my father and I very close together. And everyone in my, I don't, I work 365 days a year because um, everyone in my family and my friends either own stock, they right. own a franchise, they're an employee. And so there's never a dinner at Easter or Christmas or Thanksgiving or any holiday where uh, we're not talking about my businesses. Yeah, I totally understand that. So what attracted you to franchising? What made you, when did you decide to start franchising? Well, actually H&R Block is a franchise. So I was, I was introduced to it very early. Right. And uh, if um, you read my book, the second biggest mistake I ever made at Jackson Hewitt when I was building Jackson Hewitt was I started out, we bought six offices from Mel Jackson's widow and after after six months we had 11 offices a year later we had 15 a year after that we had 22. meantime h and r block had 9,000, and our goal was to be bigger than h and r block to have 9,000 offices and okay. although it's it's pretty good in two and a half years to go from six offices to 22 i realized that was going to be about uh, 2200 years old by by the time i got to h and r block size so we copied what Block had done and many others and immediately started franchising. Okay. And then what happened next? Well, the uh, we began, we went from 22 offices to 49 to 200 to 300 to 500. And so we very grew very quickly. Again, we sold the company for $483 million. It became a billion dollar company. And I had a, a three year non-compete and- right. The non-compete didn't cover Canada. And having grown up in Buffalo, I knew the Canadian tax system. So my next venture was to open Liberty Tax in Canada. Okay, got it, got it. Did you end up growing it uh, to be bigger than H&R Block? Did that happen? Actually, Li Liberty within 12 years grew to uh, 4,000 locations. So between the two, yeah. uh, Jackson knew it at 6,000, Liberty had 4,000. H&R Block never got, they they are today are still at the 9,000 they were in August of 82 when I started Jackson Hewitt. So my two companies combined have 10,000 offices and right. uh, they're bigger than Block, but neither company got as big as H&R Block. Was it helpful to you to have a vision of getting bigger than H&R Block to kind of inspire your team and create a, you know, kind of a, a vision of what success and what the direction the company's headed into? Yeah, I've built two of the top 100 retail chains in the country, two $500 million companies. And to do that, part of part of what a leader needs to do is they need to have, have a goal that's somewhat rational and mm -hmm. they need to be able to sell that goal. So yes, right. ha having that, that target mm -hmm. made it a lot, it made it is a team building, uh, team building venture. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a big believer in that. You need a rival or you need some kind of clear vision uh, to inspire people and to motivate people and show them the path that you're on. Exactly. Yeah. So let's talk about public relations. Uh, my understanding is you're uh, an advocate for PR. And tell me about how did you use PR to build your various companies? Well, I'll take you back to when I first got into block management, they moved me to Elmira, New York. And in Elmira, New York, they had had a flood. And there's a special tax break that you get if you are in a, an area that's declared a national di disaster area, you can amend your return immediately. So this was September of 75. And um, I, uh, the flood had just happened in, in this, in, June of 75. And so it was declared a national disaster area. So in looking for an opportunity to, to use PR, went to, we, I invented a strategy that we, and I was still at H&R Block, we would um, amend any everyone's tax term, anyone that was affected by the flood for free. And wow. so I went to, um, I was in an area of called the Southern Tier of New York, and it had Corning, New York, Ithaca, New York, Hornell, Watkins Glen, 
Elmira, okay. Sayre, Pennsylvania. And every, every one of them had a radio station. They had TV. They had little newspapers. I got so much public relations for doing free tax returns, amending free tax returns. Right. That, um, I won the national award at H&R Block for the most public relations that year. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. And that PR of good faith offering to, you know, re amend people's tax returns probably cr created some sense of uh, loyalty in addition to the visibility, right? You know, um, people love it when you do things like that. We, we had more customers come in and pay us to do a return the, in the following year just because we had made that offer than we did free returns. So it yeah. actually, it actually is very, all PR, uh, all brand name recognition is, is powerful, yes. Yeah. So to clarify, you're saying that not only did you do X number of complimentary amended returns, but then you saw even more uh, people who were, for lack of a better word, strangers who had heard about your good work uh, or your goodwill and who didn't exactly come in to have their, uh, their tax return amended, but they just came in saying, we heard, we heard what you guys did and we want to do business with a company like yours. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, John, I personally think that's one of the big things that people miss about P or misunderstand about PR, right? They're looking for PR to be self-serving. They're looking for PR to, uh, you know, just tell their story because they want it told as opposed to what you're describing is you did something good for the community that was PR worthy. And in exchange for doing something good, you created you know, from the value you created, you raised visibility in the market. And that drove you know, good faith from the community saying, I want to do business with this organization. That's exactly right. It's, it's, it, the PRS has the, uh, the huge value of, of creating brand name, of course. And, and there are so many different um, companies, industries, opportunities that are constantly bombarding the, the average American with, it could be online, it could be TV, radio, newspaper, whatever. You're constantly bombarded by messages, and it's so hard to get brand name. PR gives you that brand name, and it also creates, as as you indicated, it creates a a loyalty and a uh, support of the local community. They they're happy to see that you're helping helping their the uh, community. Yeah, excellent, excellent, John. Hey, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we'll be back on the other side in just a minute. Uh, we're going to talk to you about uh, the three ways franchisors can use PR to grow their company. We're also going to talk about how you can get a copy of John's book, I Compete. And we'll be right back after this message. You're listening to On Top of PR with your host, Jason Mudd. Jason is a trusted advisor to some of America's most admired and fastest growing brands. He is the managing partner at Axia Public Relations, a PR agency that guides news, social, and web strategies for national companies. And now, back to the show. Hey, welcome back to On Top of PR. Jason Mudd here, joined by John Hewitt. And we've enjoyed learning more about his background. And now we're really going to dive a little bit deeper into the three ways franchisors can use PR to grow their company. We may have gotten a little ahead of ourselves and started that process. But, John, let's talk about uh, using PR to build credibility. Yeah, I'll give you another example of that, um, of how I use PR in, in um, building brand name and customer base. When we um, were... When I started Jackson Hewitt, we had we started in Virginia Beach Market, and we had 21 offices here. And when we decided to franchise, we said, "Well, if someone's going to be interested in a franchise, they they're going to look at it and say, well, you can do you can do taxes and be successful in Virginia Beach, but how are how's that going to go in Las Vegas or in Chicago right. or in Miami?" And so we decided to open in one of the closest major cities in. Durham, North Carolina, about a three hour drive from here. And we okay. opened and in, in, I've been very successful. And as I described, I had won a couple of national awards at H and R block with our 9,000 offices and, uh, invented a, a, a concept that one in one March, in that first March, when we opened in Durham, North Carolina, we saw an article in the paper that 
5,000 employees were going to be laid off from a factory. So we, we issued a press release that it was, it was March of um, 1984. And we issued a press release that we would do tax transfer free for any of the laid off employees. Well, we got um, on the local news that night at 11 o'clock news, we, we were on both two of the three major stations. We got a half hour radio talk show. We got a nice article in the local paper and uh, with a picture. And the we only ended up doing about six or seven uh, free returns for employees. But again, we had twice that many people that came in and said, that was very nice of what you did. Um, we're going to use you because you you that was such a nice gesture of your company to right. offer, offer free tax returns for employees. So that's, we're always looking for an opportunity. There, there's, when you, when you try to get the attention of the press, you need to look for things that are happening and come, come at it with a different twist. Earlier, I talked about when there was a flood in, in the Elmira Corning area of, of New York that we offered free amended returns. Well, there's so many articles written when a natural disaster area, the press is always looking for after a few days for a new angle. So we always right. try to invent a new angle for, for, um, public relations. Uh, one story I love, I, from a competitor, I was very, uh, I was very jealous of this. And it was uh, many years ago, maybe 25, 30 years ago that Philadelphia cream cheese, the Philadelphia Eagles were going in to Dallas to have their, uh, to have a playoff game 25, mm -hmm. 30 years ago. And one of the grocery chains in, in or, or no, Philadelphia cream cheese took their cream cheese off of the shelves of the grocery store because, <laughs> because uh, they, they were competitors of uh, the um, Dallas Cowboys. So right. I think you have to look for opportunities like that to draw the attention of the public. Yeah, I love that. I love that. You know, in the business today, we call this, someone has termed this newsjacking. And so that's the term that is often used to take, you know, where something is happening in the news and you twist it or, or position it to your benefit um, later. And, you know, to your point, sometimes you got to newsjack very quickly uh, because the media isn't going to cover something for, you know, several days. But the, the examples you gave, I think, are very good because they have, uh, you know, a longer tail or a longer timeline. So I, lo I love the idea of turning floods and layoffs, uh, you know, into a newsjacking uh, opportunity. Um, <clears throat> let me ask you, John, when you were telling me about um, 5,000 employees being laid off, right? Um, what's the mindset you have to have to take advantage of an opportunity like that? Because, you know, if you weren't the boss and you had a less uh, ambitious ownership group or um, leadership team, you know, they might be scared to death that they're going to get, you know, overwhelmed with nearly 5,000 people looking for free services? Yeah, the, you have to test it. Um, you know, I've always, I've always um, uh, tested things and you test it on a small scale. And I saw back when we had done the, all the articles and, and all of the publicity we got from the flooding, we didn't, we didn't do very many tax returns. And you can imagine Jason, that it doesn't cost much to do a tax turn. The flood was in in June, and it doesn't cost a lot to do a tax turn in July, August, September, October, November because oh, sure. we, yeah. we're, we don't have we don't have staff, and so we can make an appointment and do it by appointment only. So um, you you have to look for opportunities that um, don't cost much. And we've learned by experience what when I was at Jackson Hewitt, we invented a a um, give back to the uh, customer day, a give back to our customers. And so okay. on on every fr one Friday in March, we would do free tax returns. And that was our way to give back to to our customers and the community. And so. I had one franchisee in um, in upstate 
uh, New Jersey, across from the city that um, got an article in the local paper. We're going to do free tax turns in on this Friday. The neighboring franchise was so terrified of that, they locked right. their door. They locked their door <laughs> and it did not open. So, right. so second year comes along, the the, fran- the franchise, and he didn't do five returns for free that day. And because March is a very slow period, people are people that want their refund quick have already filed, and people right, that right. are procrastinators wait till April. So mm-hmm. it's not very busy. And so the the next year came, and the franchisee next door, she was going to lock her door again. And and one of my support people said, "Well, what should I do?" And I said, "Well, let's tell her that we will pay her." Full price on anyone that comes in during right. during that Friday. So I, the convention happened a couple months later. I ran into her, and uh, I, her name was Lynn. I said, Lynn, how did it go? And she said, well, actually, I, ha- I had three customers, and it worked incredibly well because I'm one of the customers. Their, their sister came in, and uh, they paid in April on a different day. They, they referred their customer and they referred the cu- customer, a paid customer. And on the second customer, they had two prior year returns to do. So I mm-hmm. did the, this year's return for free and I got paid on two prior returns. So it worked like a charm. Yeah, so, absolutely. So um, the, it was funny because how people are because people just don't listen. They don't learn. The third year came along and got an article again and the support person called up and said, you're never going to believe what Lynn asked. And, and I said, yes, yeah. she asked if we would pay again. And I said, no. And she locked her door again. What? <laughs> it's, it's, and then she was a franchise for five years. And at the end of five years, she just walked away. It was, uh, she did not have the mindset of an entrepreneur. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, it's funny you mention this because you're reminding me of a, of a story early in my career, John. Um, we were doing a canned good drive and I was on a radio station and they were doing the canned good thing or whatever. And they kind of put me on the spot and they were like, hey, Jason, you know, what is your company going to do if somebody comes in and brings a canned good? And at the time we were in the business of selling twenty dollar a month services. And so I said, hey, for every canned good you bring in, I'm going to you know, we're going to give away a month of free service. And man, my boss heard that radio interview live, and I think he pulled a U-turn on the interstate and came back to tell me how he felt about that, right? I mean, as you can imagine, a canned good didn't cost hardly anything, right? And here we are giving away $20 in service. So he came into my office and kind of told me exactly how he felt about that, and I was pretty upset. And the good news is I think we only had about five to seven redemptions, and they just brought in one canned good. They weren't looking to take advantage of the offer like I had phrased it or whatever. And so you're reminding of that situation, right? He had the fear mentality as an entrepreneur um, and never and told me he really struggled to run a business. You know, it was really hard for him. But I guess, John, one thought that comes to mind is I'm thinking from this as a contrarian standpoint, you know, there's somebody who would say, well, does PR even work if we only had so many people come in and actually redeem? And I think your story is really good. And I wonder if you have any other anecdotals uh, that, you know, even though a lot of people didn't respond to uh, the request to do a recap or a, a refile, you had people come in who heard about you and felt good about you. So, uh, you yeah. know, what would you say to that person who says that's not a lot of redemption? So did the PR even work? We um, learned at. You know, when I, after I sold Jackson Hewitt and I started Liberty, I had Jackson Hewitt for 15 years and and grew it to a half a billion dollar company. And if you if you uh, get to start all over again and you don't do it a lot better, you're an idiot. And, <laughs> right. And um, we had the one the the one customer appreciation day was so successful that we expanded that at Liberty Tax, and and now at Liberty I had to compete against my own name my own software, right. my own system at Jackson Hewitt. Absolutely. So we went to, to free reta- tax returns all of March. And, um, and because again, March is very slow. The average office does in 12 hours a day does about three or four tax returns. So they have 
six, seven, eight hours a day, they're not doing anything. The preparers just sitting there fully available, already paid for. And so the cost to do a free tax run is very low. It costs less than $10 to do a free tax run. Well, what okay. happens, Jason, is let me take you through the math quickly. The, okay. the average tax return today, and ATAX is our brand today, the average tax return today is in the country of H&R Block or ATAX or, is about $250. So okay. let's pretend that we, we require the, each office give back 100 free returns to the community in March. And they have to be by appointment only and new customers only. So what we've learned is that we actually makes money because out of the 100 returns you do, and we keep statistics on this, I've been doing this since uh, 2000, that okay. over 30 customers come back and pay you full price. And you get a, at least 20 referrals. So you get 20, you get for every 100 free returns you do, you get 50 people between the 30 re right. people that return and pay full price and mm -hmm. the 20 referrals that pay full price, you get 50 customers paying you $250, you get $12,500. And so actually, if you divide that by the, the number of customers, you're getting $125 each on when you give a free return. And it only costs you $10. And yeah, the, right. the, the profit on the incremental customers is 70 or 80%. And so you make, and that's only the one year impact because those customers are gonna come back again and they're gonna refer customers in the future. But the immediate yeah. impact in, the, in 12 months of giving a free return is um, you're making $125. Yeah, yeah, I love that. The other thing I really like about what you shared, and this is something that I think we've done a solo cast on in the past, is this idea that in order to calculate your true ROI, John, as you know and I know as business owners, you've got to know what your true profit margins are and what your true cost of doing business is because otherwise you're calculating what I call your return on value or maybe your return on, um, on income, right? But to get your true ROI for your investment, whether that's in PR or marketing, whatever you're doing, you want to make back the profit, not just the income. And I love how you walked us through uh, that math. It was very clear to me. And uh, I think that makes a lot of sense for our audience also. Yeah, and that's not typical way people think. They think right. like your boss did that, oh, that's costing me money. That's costing me money, right? I have another example, if I can take sure. a minute. The um, yeah. in, in our industry, uh, there you can have your fee deducted from the refund and then uh, you don't pay us anything up front. And what happens is about 2%, two or 3% of the time, the IRS holds that money. And mm -hmm. so that $250 that I was talking about, the IRS holds that the um, your refund because you have you have student debt or back taxes or child support and you didn't pay it. And so they catch up with you and they hold your refund. So now the customer has an outstanding $250 liability. And so the major companies uh, and, and even the companies I've left have changed their policy. What I say is you give it to them for free. And so this is the way that I think of it. The average office does a thousand returns and let's say you're going to have 30 customers that fall into this situation. The other customers say, well, that's Mr. Franchisee, that's 30 customers at $250 a piece. You have an accounts receivable of $7,500. You need to go collect that money. And because they want their royalty too, the, the uh, franchisor wants their royalty. Right. So you got to collect that that money and and the way i explain it is no it didn't it didn't cost you 250 dollars. it cost you the incremental cost to do each tax return during right. the the year is less than 30 dollars. so um even when it's busy and so it costs it it cost you only 900 dollars. now They'll even they even give you a collection agency to try to go in that 
get that money. And what I train my people is that's horrible customer service. If you have 30 people that didn't get your refund and you try to collect from them, how many are ever going to come back to you and pay you in the future? Right. right. You go to them and say, you know what, Mr. Mr. Smith, you didn't get your your four thousand dollar refund, but and now you owe me two hundred fifty dollars. Well, we've had bomb threats and bricks thrown through Jeez. windows and right. uh, all trying to collect that money. But if you go to the customer and say, you know what, I'm sorry you didn't get your refund. We're not going to charge you. We're not going to charge you a fee. So our fee, we're going to waive our fee this year. And so it co it costs you nine hundred dollars. Now, what what I say is, if you want to chart, you know that's going to happen in, up front. You know, in on uh, this is January. Uh, you know that that it's that you're going to have thirty people that aren't going to pay. You. So with a thousand customers, it's going to cost you nine hundred to prepare the returns for those thirty. Right. Charge ninety cents extra per customer. And you cover the whole cost. It costs you nothing. And mm -hmm. you, you yeah. don't lose customers. You don't turn off customers. You get the goodwill of an appreciation and mm -hmm. respect of the people mm -hmm. you did a great gesture for. And it costs you zero dollars. Yeah. I love that. Uh, so a dollar more per return. Nobody's going to notice. Nobody's going to complain about that. No one's going to not buy from you over a dollar, probably. And you also, for lack of a better expression, you didn't kick somebody while they're down. And and how many people are they going to tell? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Or in the modern era, John, not go online and vent and post a negative review or go to social media and say, those guys, they didn't even give me my money, you know, whatever. Because I, I'm sure there was a lot of misunderstanding when that happened and you need to be gentle and kind of help those people understand exactly what happened. Exactly. People people count on that money. and, and I, Oh, I, yeah. The the uh, most of our customers live paycheck to paycheck, and right. that's that's a month of paychecks for them, and Absolutely. they're looking forward to it, and they're broken hearted when they don't get that money. They've already got it spent in their mind when they come into the office. Right, exactly. So, John, we we agreed we were going to talk about three things today, three ways franchisors can use PR to grow their company. I feel like we've done two of them. Uh, we've talked about building credibility. We've talked about generating journalist interest. Um, do you agree we've covered those two so far well? I think so. Is there anything else? Okay, perfect. So then you you wanted to share your story about the Wall Street Journal's success and other national publications. Yeah, the Wall Street Journal took me a long, long time to get into. A long, long okay. time. When I was at um, um, when I was at H and R Block back in the in late seventies. I saw a mistake that there there was a a um, author that on every Wednesday there was a one column in the Wall Street Journal on the front page was devoted to tax taxes income tax right and um, one time I saw an error so I saw an error in the column and it was in um, the Wall Street Journal was headquartered in New York I went many. I went and had lunch or many times after that with this particular writer. But um, I uh, saw an error that he had made. He he gave a an advice on a situation, a federal situation that affected New York State, and he got it wrong. So mm -hmm. I, I reached out to him, and, and they're surprisingly not that difficult to contact. You know, you would think if you, you I've, contacted the New York Times, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, CBS, NBC, ABC. My people have reached out. I've been on every major, every major um, public uh, uh, or, or um, newspaper or radio TV. And so I reached out and said, you made a mistake. And he said, well, I'm going to check that. He said, mm -hmm. if you're if you're right, he said, I'm going to. Um, so he called back. And he said, you were right. I'm going to issue a, a change on next Wednesday. He said, I'm either going to cite you in the in the column or I'm going to call Henry Block and tell him you did it. He's got a an employee in, in Elmira, New York, that does a great job. Okay. And, and sure enough, he didn't cite me in the he did not cite me in the 
the paper the next week. But he did mm -hmm. call Henry Bach and tell him I was doing a great job. And, and funny thing later, a year later, I was promoted. So um, I, that may have something to do with it. But right. um, the, what did happen even better is that when I started Jackson Hewitt, we started a relationship that I would go and have lunch with him at least once a year. And in fact, one time I took him to, it was so, uh, I, won't, I guess I shouldn't tell the whole story, it'd, it'd take too long, but I took him to a Yankee game. And okay. I, was, I was going up to have lunch with him. The plane was delayed. I wasn't gonna get on time. And I said, but I can meet you on the way to the Yankee game tonight. And, and uh, I'm, it was a World Series. And, oh, God. and I said, um, I can take it or you can come to the game with us. He said, well, let me check my ethics committee. And he called back and said, I can, if I pay for the ticket, I can go with you to the game. He said, so I'll meet you at the hotel. Well, I was going to scalp tickets. I always scalp tickets to mm -hmm. world's big events like that. And, but I always do it outside the stadium. And he came to the hotel to meet myself and my, my right. um, director of marketing. And so I said, what are we going to do? I, I don't have the tickets. And I'm going to have yeah. to tell him that we're going to scalp the tickets. And right. he's only going to pay the $100. So uh, while we were talking, we the um, desk clerk overheard us. And I think she said, I think they have over at whatever desk that is there, the, the service Concierge. desk. Concierge. And the concierge, yeah. I think the concierge has some tickets. So I went over there and I had to buy four tickets at $800 a piece. The worst right. tickets I ever had. And <laughs> uh, to get my my marketing director and him and myself into the game. And um, and the face value was $100. Right. So, so but that relationship where we got, we got, um, publicized in the Wall Street Journal every mm -hmm. about once a month or two just because of our relationship over the years was invaluable. Yeah, nice, nice. That's a good story. I like that a lot. Um, and uh, I, I guess as we've covered the three items, yeah, what I want to point out is we talked about to build credibility, to generate journalist interest. And then the third thing was really, in my mind, about relationships, right? Building relationships with people and not rushing into the relationship, but just building it slowly over time. And I'm often, uh, you know, I'm often saying to people, we, we need to put relationships back into public relations because everyone's thinking PR is just about exposure and visibility. But the truth is, it's really important that we're focused on the people and the relationship building. Exactly. And that, you know, that I didn't say the time frame. I called him in about 1978. I didn't get it listed. At, my name didn't get in the Wall Street Journal for five or six years later. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, in our business, in my experience, I've owned this agency for 20 years now. I find the clients that stay with us the longest are the ones that get the most visibility year over year because it's a long-term endeavor. It's not instant and overnight. And the other thing I found is that it's about paying it forward. And, you know, like you did, you kind of helped out a journalist out of a, you know, a, a sticky or whatever situation. And they didn't forget that and they remembered you. And so at least with my experience with my clients is when we help out a reporter in that way, they call on you again. And that next call may not be to have you be in a story, but it might be, hey, I'm writing a story about a topic I'm not really familiar with or this nuance I've never heard of. Could you guide me and make sure I'm covering this properly? And that is the icing on the cake to building that relationship is to pay it forward. And you know, I was reading recently this idea that People don't mind doing favors for other people. And in fact, if you do them a favor, they feel indebted to you, right? So of course, uh, that's very valuable and a good step to take. I think so many people miss that because they want that instant gratification, John. Uh, in fact, just recently, somebody called me and they're like the chief strategy officer for this tech company. And so PR follows under their role and responsibility. But they've never practiced PR before. They don't have a lot of PR experience and familiarity. So they were doing some PR outreach and they were getting some mentions of their experts in the organization. But those expert mentions were not mentioning the company or if they were, they were just brief. And so the guy made a foolish mistake and he started calling these reporters saying, hey, I've helped you out on three stories and not once have you featured our company yet. You know, I'm not going to help you on stories anymore until you start featuring our company. Well, John, I know you know how those conversations went, right? Exactly. Unpleasant. Yeah, they, 
Yeah, they didn't go very well. The right. reporter basically just said, hey, I appreciate your help, but I don't need you to be able to do my job, right? Uh, and, 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 and so he had that conversation with several reporters, I guess on the same day, he was frustrated or whatever, had a little ax to grind. And that's when he said, it's time for us to hire a PR firm because now we've got to do reputation and damage control right? In addition to just trying to get mentioned again. But he just thought, you know, if he answered a few questions one time, the journalist would automatically like him and want to do a whole story about their company. And I had to explain to him that it's about a relationship, building trust, helping each other out, and maybe they'll do something about you. But I don't know about you, but I've gotten more comments when I've provided substantive commentary and expert helpful advice when I'm quoted in the news. I've gotten more leads and more business from that than when I'm featured about winning an award or you know, growing and expanding because people want to know, you know, what you're talking about and you might be growing quick and having accolades, but they really want to hear from an expert. When you say something that's provocative, contrarian, has a unique point of view, you know, that gets people interested. Exactly. I've never dared say to a reporter, you must list, list me in your, in your radio show or your story, or, yeah. or TV. You didn't, I've never dared say such a thing. Yeah. I have a very interesting one that happened in um, Albany. To, we had a sign up from a Lady Liberty and the, um, the, the local, the, the franchisee of Liberty Tax had worked with, with Jackson Hewitt and the Jackson Hewitt manager came by and, and was berating him in for having, for um, competing with Jackson Hewitt. And right. While he was doing that, someone picked up the cardboard sign, cost $60 or $80, the cardboard uh, six foot high Statue of Liberty and, and put it in the pickup truck and they drove away. Well, he he didn't know that that had happened, but the next door neighbor had a a camera and right. they, caught, they caught them on camera. So we re report, we called the, um, the manager and said, you pay us or we're going to report you to the mm -hmm. police. So reported to police, reported, and so I heard about it. And I said, call the TV station, call the radio. And right. we, were on, we were on two news news uh, that night, two 11 o'clock news. And uh, one of them did a full five minutes about how the Jackson Hewitt manager had stolen the, the Statue of Liberty uh, right. cardboard cutout from Liberty. And I said, I said to Jackson, yeah, we should do this all over the country. <laughs> oh, John, I love how opportunistic you are about leveraging these PR opportunities and wish more of our clients thought the same way. I think this is great. So, hey, as we're wrapping up, um, uh, any other closing thoughts on how franchisors could leverage PR for their brand? You, you know, what we do at training, we, we go through the local paper and look for events that are happening. Um, it might be a strawberry festival. It, it might be a parade. Uh, we're in parades. We're in, we have booths at, at festivals and oyster festivals and so forth. So we teach them to look and think differently. Look at what's happening in your community. See how you can participate because it's all about building brand name. You can't get a customer if, you, if they've never heard of you. The first thing that starts is is brand name. And then when you add the goodwill that by doing good things in the community right. add to your brand name, I mean, it's priceless. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. I often tell people, how can someone do business with you if they've never heard of you? Or if your name is obscure or they, they just don't understand uh, what who you are and what you do and what you offer. So, you know, if you're hoping that someone might hear of you, uh, and do business with you, it's probably not going to happen. But if you hire a PR agency or agent or PR person, you should start to generate some visibility in the marketplace, some understanding, trust, and consideration for your services. Uh, John, just in closing, because our topic here is about how to grow or how to, uh, you know, franchisors can use PR to, to grow their company. I think one of the mistakes a lot of franchisors make, and what I love about what we've talked about today, John, is this idea of using PR to build up your local locations. And, you know, that's something I think a lot of franchisors overlook. And, you know, at the end of the day, most franchisors are trying to do two things, right? Attract more franchisees and ultimately grow franchisee sales. 
And the two can work together very, very well, especially when you give your franchisees an opportunity to look good, sound good, and demonstrate and promote their success as a franchisee. That attracts other people who say, I think I could do that too, or I want something like this for myself, right? And too often, I find that franchisors are just like, just focus on our brand, just focus on our story. But their story and their story of success extends to the success of the franchisees that are out in the field, you know, that are the you know, the, for lack of a better word, kind of the micro business that is really successful because of the parent company. Um, John, what are your thoughts on that? I think that that's clear. Jason, in, in this country, there are 4,000 franchisors and that belong to the International Franchise Association. To be in mm-hmm. the top 50% of all franchisors, you only need 20 locations. So most franchisors are failures. Mm. And it's due to this one simple thing that you just described. It's they do not understand this simple concept. The concept of is simply this happy, successful franchisees. That's our yep. m- mantra. If yep. the franchisees are happy and successful, you can't stop growing by leaps and bounds. If they're not, you can't grow by any by any large measure. So it comes down to simply understanding your success as a franchisor is happy, successful franchisees. I love that. And I totally agree with that idea and that concept. I've, I've worked with franchisors that have great meteoric success, but then they don't deliver on taking care of their franchisees. And next thing you know, they're getting either sued or people are defaulting or just operating in breach of that contract because they don't feel like there's any good faith. So, uh, John, I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, I, w- I know we're going to talk about, uh, you know, how somebody can get a hold of your book. I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that. But at the same time, tell our audience what, you, you know, kind of what you do and how you can help them. Or, you know, maybe somebody's listening to this and thinking about starting a franchise or whatever. Just kind of enlighten our audience on how you can be helpful and then tell them how they can get a free copy of your book. Well, at my age, Jason, most people are retired and um, to me, I can't even imagine retiring. They got to kill me to stop me. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, I thought I'd make millions of dollars. I, I was cocky when I was in high school, and I said I'm going to make some few million dollars and retire. And then I realized, what would I do after that? Right. There, there's nothing more fun than changing lives and improving lives. And so that's what I've done my entire career, and that's what keeps me going. I can't imagine at my level of after 54 years of uh, business success and building two of the top 100 retail chains in this country, I founded a billion dollar company and a half a billion dollar company. And I can't imagine going sitting on a beach somewhere and just wasting away. I am at the peak of my knowledge and my expertise. I'm here to help people improve. And so people can reach out and, and get my advice. It's it's pretty simple. And, and that's one of the reasons I do podcasts is to give back. And I think uh, it's obvious and it's biblical to whom much is given, much is expected. And it's it's all about giving back. And so that's what I'm about, giving back, changing lives. Excellent. John, I think this has been a great episode um, and uh, really glad that we connected for this. So Um, I want to say thank you to um, Mary Jane for connecting us, introducing us. Uh, John, uh, real quick, so if somebody wants a copy of your book, what action do they take? All they have to do is uh, send me an email at john at loyaltybrands.com, J-O-H-N at loyaltybrands.com. Okay. And you'll want their shipping address, right? Um, Then I'll ask, um, I'll have my assistant get their address and... um, first thing, and then we'll we'll send them a book. Okay, excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, John, again, it's been great, a uh, great pleasure talking to you. I love how we've got some synergies and, and, and similar thinking on, you know, how PR can be valuable to growing a franchise. Um, and uh, I think if somebody just takes a little bit of the advice they heard today, they'll probably enjoy much success. And uh, it's been a real pleasure connecting with you. Congrats on all your success and your desire to keep going and your desire to give back to others. Um, and like you said, you know, for much has been entrusted, you know, you have to be responsible and give back as well. And that's one thing I've always wondered when people have incredible success like you and others, 
how they just, you know, keep it to themselves and they're not out there proactively trying to help other people, uh, you know, the same way, you know, you and I have both been successful. Obviously, you've been quite a bit more successful, but we all know we didn't do it on our own. Right. It was, it was people who gave us a shot or were there along for the journey. And uh, and I think people forget that too often. So I'm glad that, that you have that position in life. So good for you and uh, good for our audience today to have this opportunity to connect uh, with John Hewitt to talk about his story. And uh, I hope you liked this episode. And if you did, take a moment to share it on social media or with a colleague or friend who you think would benefit from it. Um, you know, we're not alone in this world and we really should take the opportunity to, to ask for help from others and take advice and recommendations from others to help us grow. So with that, I hope today you felt like we helped you stay on top of PR. This is Jason Mudd with Axia Public Relations signing off and wishing you much success. Be well. This has been On Top of PR with Jason Mudd, presented by ReviewMaxer. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and check out past shows at ontopofpr.com. <laughs>